This uh, presentation will be regarding the compressor recycle or in other parts of the world, also known as the anti-surge valve. Um, uh, I have uh, extensive uh, experience with this uh, with this application as uh, I, I got to uh, not only design and engineer, but also I got to operate the anti-surge valve firsthand uh, during my experience uh, in, in refining. And uh, I would also like to mention that I'm also an ISA member of the Orange County, Orange County, California chapter as well. So uh, I, I have uh, a little bit of experience in this uh, in this application here. OK, uh, today we will be talking about uh, the compressor uh, recycle valve, right? Uh, really quick, uh, what does the anti surge valve do? Uh, causes of surge. Uh, uh, parameters that affect the anti-surge valve sizing problems and also the REXA electrohydraulic solution. Um, sometimes I speak a little fast and so if I you see me getting excited about this topic and I begin to speak a little fast, uh, don't feel, please feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask any questions or uh, to repeat uh, something that I previously said. Um, I would like to say that in, in the U.S., um, uh, the anti-surge, uh, the, the name for this application is mostly anti-surge, but I, I am aware that in other parts of the world, it's called the recycle valve. As you can see, uh, this simplified uh, drawing of a compressor over to the left. <clears throat> uh, the anti-surge valve, also known as a recycle valve, and in some cases, it's also called the spillback valve. You'll see me use these terms interchangeably, uh, but they all they all mean the same application. Uh, there is one more application here that is very, very similar to the anti-surge valve. It's not the same, but it's very similar in its operation and design. Uh, the main difference is um, that the blow-off valve and the recycle valve, for example, the, the blow-off valve, uh, if it's on a main air blower, for example, uh, the uh, the way this valve uh, uh, opens, it, it will vent to atmosphere. Uh, obviously, the recycle valve, it's in the name. It will recycle uh, flow from the discharge side to the suction side. Uh, but both valves are, are have similar uh, requirements of fast acting, fast stroking speeds. Um, here is a simplified drawing. I'll be using this drawing throughout uh, the, rec the presentation and uh, that's a simplified drawing, and in some cases, I'll show a little bit more detail. Uh, simplified P and ID. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, what is the primary job of the anti-surge valve? Well, the number one job of this valve is to protect the compressor from surge, right? And it has to do this in the most, in the fastest and most effective way possible. That is the number one job, right? It's it, it it's in the name, and the way it does that is if the valve uh, if, the, if the controller senses that the compressor is getting close to surge, uh, it begins to open the anti-surge valve or the recycle valve so that it can send uh, flow from the discharge side to the suction side, right? That is the number one job of, of, this, uh, of this actuator. Um, during startup or shutdown, as you may know, it is a very... Uh, uh, very uh, difficult uh, conditions uh, when you're starting up and shutting down, right? In this case, uh, the valve may be open, uh, completely open, or it may throttle, depending on uh, on the flow, pressure, temperature, uh, readings of the compressor, right? Once you get that compressor running uh, at uh, normal conditions or normal operations, uh, that anti-surge valve usually is more often than not, it remains in the closed position. OK, every now and then if uh, that uh, valve is getting or I'm sorry, if that compressor is getting close to the surge limit line, uh, it may open temporarily and then close uh, so that it can recycle some of that flow back from the discharge back to the suction side. Uh, since we talked about surge, what is surge? Um, uh, in, in a nutshell, without getting into the weeds of uh, the full explanation. The short answer is surge is a reversal of flow. OK, and this can happen very fast, uh, a lot faster than we humans can detect. And in some cases, uh, even instruments 
uh, conventional instruments may not be able to detect or to recognize surge. That is why so much attention and uh, there's there have been companies built around surge control. Uh, it is it is a very uh, fen important phenomenon to be able to capture and control uh, to prevent uh, uh, unnecessary shutdowns. Uh, the uh, search can happen in as fast as 20 to 50 milliseconds. And if it is not taken care of, or for example, if the anti-surge valve, the recycle valve, if it uh, overshoots or undershoots, that may create a cycling of surge so that it, it, it can it stays in surge, right? You will notice uh, during surge that the that you'll get some uh, compressor vibration. Uh, temperature begins to go uh, to go up and you'll get some oscillation and flow, right? As you can see here, these are these are just uh, some uh, readings of what can happen during surge. As you can see, you, you'll get oscillation in both flow and pressure, right? As that compressor tries to kind of stable out to get back to, st to stability, uh, you'll get some oscillation in flow and pressure and you'll also get an increase it in temperature inside that compressor. OK, um, well, what causes surge? Um, many, many things could could cause surge. Uh, certainly uh, startup and shutdown. They're very critical conditions. Uh, I remember during my time in refineries when we were starting up or shutting down, uh, we had to be uh, very alert and we had to be ready for any possible uh, emergency shutdown because it's it's a very critical uh, point in a, in, in, a, in a plant. Uh, those two those two times. Um, also, if uh, they reduce throughput um, by a substantial means, that could also create uh, some surging. OK, um, some uh, comp some uh, changes in gas composition. Uh, also, turbo machinery overspeed, faulty instrumentation. All of these things could create or or be a cause for surge, right? Um, also, uh, another cause for surge, um, it could be actuator created, right? We all know what happens to an actuator when it's been sitting for a long time. If it's been sitting in, a, in one position for a very long time, uh, that actuator may experience stiction, okay? And uh, when it's called to operate, the valve may not open or close or throttle like it needs to, right? And it may jump or overshoot, which could create oscillation, which could possibly throw you into surge, right? Uh, malfunctioning volume boosters and quick exhaust. This was a common, common problem, uh, especially in California. We were in a area that was very close to the coast, right? And so you would get a lot of dirt or debris or even tiny bugs that would nest inside the portholes of these volume boosters and quick exhausts. And once you block, uh, or once dirt or bugs block that air passage, that volume booster can't uh, inject or extract air fast enough. Okay, and that that will uh, that will have a detrimental effect on the anti-surge valve. Uh, another. Um, Another cause of uh, that could lead to to surge to surge is also insufficient air supply. If the anti surge valve is far away from the air the instrument air compressor, if that recycle valve is not getting enough uh, enough air, you could be starving the actuator of air, and therefore it won't be able to operate appropriately. Uh, if that actuator has been fitted with a volume tank and for whatever reason the volume tank is leaking an operator left the valve open then uh, it won't have enough air uh, for the uh, recycle valve to use when it what it needs to right and one last thing to remember uh, and this is where my example of being close to the coast was a problem being so close to the coast created a lot of humidity in the air and as you all know, instrument air is not the same air that we breathe. Uh, instrument air needs to be very, very dry and very clean. And if the air dryers in your air compressor are not adequately maintained, you could have condensation that builds up in the instrument airlines. OK, and that, of course, will be a problem. 
especially during a search condition when that valve needs a lot of air. And if there's condensation, well, that that it, it will prevent the actuator from doing its job because of insufficient air. And, and last but not least, also is a, a faulty positioner or or an IDP that could uh, that could uh, not be operable and and thus uh, uh, create uh, some some fault conditions with the with the anti surge valve as well, right? <clears throat> if uh, the quick exhausts or the volume boosters are not tuned correctly with uh, the compressor control, right? That could lead to excessive overshoot. And that is something that happens a lot, uh, especially when you start adding a lot of volume boosters and quick exhaust. I remember uh, having to tune it. And it was always a tuning nightmare, uh, having to get the right tuning uh, for the actuator, uh, for the actuator, right? And you you kind of uh, you you optimize one side, but then the other side suffers, right? So not only is is overshoot good, but also undershoot, right? Now that could also uh, create uh, additional instability, right? Which could lead to oscillation, and 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 that is bad for for a compressor. That could lead to additional surge events, um, and and obviously with pneumatics, that is always a a problem is is overshoot. Uh, consequences of, of surge events, uh, this goes without saying, but obviously unstable flow and pressure, right? Your product um, is not going to be to specification. So you may have to recycle uh, a lot of your of your yield product. Uh, more importantly, uh, if you are if your compressor is experiencing many surge events, uh, your compressor will begin to wear the seals, the bearings, the impellers, the rotor, all that begins to slowly to slowly uh, get damaged and, and wear. Uh, that will lead to increased seal clearances and leakage, which leads to lower efficiency and reduced compressed pressure life. And as you can see, it just begins to get it gets worse and worse, right? Uh, and 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 that, of course, at the end of the day, that means uh, lost production, lost revenue, and uh, not only do you lose production, you lose money. You also now have to fix that compressor because it is now severely damaged, right? Um, a, a lot of money flowing out of that, out of your pockets uh, for having a, a, a uh, not functioning or badly functioning anti-surge valve. Um, <clears throat> the recycle valve is of course uh, very complicated for those of you that, that have had to size uh, the recycle valve. It's, it's, it's uh, very complicated. There are a lot of requirements that go into into designing this valve, right? A lot of parameters and process conditions must be taken into consideration. You know, uh, most importantly, of course, you know, you want to make sure you take into consideration the surge point at the at the maximum performance of the curve and the minimum. Uh, we, we can't forget that as well. Uh, we also don't want uh, uh, to the for the for the compressor to choke. So we have to take these minimum conditions as well. They're they're also equally important. Once you determine uh, what the capacity of the of the anti surge valve or the recycle valve should be, right? <clears throat> it's it's typically between 1.8 and 2.2 times the CV, right? Um, you don't want to oversize it too much uh, because then you get into a rangeability issue that I didn't discuss earlier. But that that could also be an issue. You if you oversize it by too much. You can get an, a rangeability issue, and then your flow at the at the low flow, at the minimum flow, becomes very unstable. Okay, so so uh, you know you wanna you want you wanna have all these different points uh, of consideration uh, when you're when you're designing the 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 anti surge valve, right? <clears throat> um, it has to be, and, and the reason that the anti surge valve has to be between one point eight and two point two point two times the CV. The number one answer, of course, is to ensure compressor and process safety, right? If there is a condition that uh, you're going close to surge, you want to send as much uh, of that discharge flow rate back to the suction side as fast as possible. OK, and, uh, you know, empirical data has shown that that, that usually falls between 1.8 and 2.2. Um, there are, of course, other parameters to consider uh, on, on, on the compressor map. Right, minimum speed of the compressor, max speed. You know, uh, all these points are 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 equally important. 
uh, to consider when, when designing the, uh, your anti-surge valve because you want to make sure that you are maximizing the throughput of that compressor. Uh, you want it to be operating at its uh, maximum efficiency as well. So these are all conditions here that are that are of course very important to to, to take into consideration when designing uh, the, your recy recycle valve. A few more points to consider, um, of course, are that uh, you typically want this valve to be less than 85 decibels. Okay, um, because uh, there is a lot of flow um, and it's going through a very restricted orifice, right? That could uh, you know, high velocities that could create uh, uh, large uh, levels of huge levels of noise, right? And uh, you want to make sure that your trim is designed so that uh, that noise is attenuated, right? To less than 85 decibels, right? Um, and you also want to design your 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 leakage to be either class five or class six, right? And in very rare cases, um, the a, the anti-surge valve may conform part of the safety instrumented system of the of the refinery, and uh, it may require still three. These are rare cases. Um, I will show you an example where uh, the actuator uh, is uh, part of their SIS, uh, and they uh, they asked for still three requirement. These are rare cases, like I said. Um, and other things to take into consideration, of course, are the stroking speed. That, that's probably of one of the most important critical factors when sizing uh, the anti-surge valve, right? Um, if it's uh, with solenoid, you want to be under one second, right? Um, dead bend uh, shall be less than 1% of span. Same thing with lin linearity. Overshoot, uh, like I said earlier, it begins, it, 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 it begins to get cumbersome. Uh, if you start adding more volume boosters and quick exhaust, right? But typically you want to be uh, less than 10% of the step size in the open direction. Okay, these are just uh, some considerations that are taken that are that are used when designing the the anti-surge valve. Uh, to my right is a table of of the dynamic parameters. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm sh I'm sure uh, most of you have at one point. Uh, designed or or uh, asked to size uh, an anti-surge valve and to my left is a typical pneumatic right with many volume boosters and quick exhaust and and so on and so forth just some more uh, factory and field test very important valve uh, it, it uh, a lot of uh, sizing uh, requirements and, and constraints that must be utilized to make sure you have an, uh, a properly designed anti-surge valve. And after you have done your sizing and you've taken your actuator sizing and you have the right valve, last but not least, uh, this valve, remember this valve is, is controlled by a anti-surge controller, right? And this guy is looking at different parameters in that compressor. Right, uh, speed, flow, pressure, temperature. It's looking all, at all these parameters, and uh, these sensors are, or these transmitters are sending a signal to the controller, and in the controller, it's sensing where on the compressor map it is. If it senses that it's getting close to surge, it will begin to open the recycle valve, right, and hopefully take that valve uh, away from surge. Um, very complicated <laughs> valve, very very critical piece of equipment. Common types of compressor recycle valves are you typically, uh, you see a lot of glow valves, uh, butterfly valves, and also ball valves. And everybody has their favorites. Uh, and depending on uh, how you want to control, right, they each have their pros and they each have their cons, right? Now, whether you want to control more, uh, whether you want to have more flow, uh, they each have their uh, their uh, different pros and cons. And, and I've seen all three uh, valve types in uh, in different refineries throughout the world. Uh, some trim requirements. Typically, uh, the most common is linear uh, for anti-surge. It's it's typically the easier one to uh, to uh, mo to uh, uh, tune with your with your with your with your control uh, anti-surge control, right? But I have also seen quick open and, and equal percent uh, to a lesser degree. 
So <clears throat> when designing uh, any switch valves with pneumatics, um, like I said earlier, quick exhaust and volume boosters, they can clog up and they begin to malfunction, right? Um, I also talked about stiction a little bit. That could also be a problem for some of these anti-surge valves, especially if they've been if they've been sitting idle for too long. Uh, if you get any condensation inside these uh, the instrument air supply, that could also be a that could also be a problem, right? Um, another another problem that uh, that occurs when you have a quick exhaust or a volume booster that is inoperable, right? Is that that valve will not stroke as fast as it needs to okay and, and this this happened to me a couple times in our liquid recovery unit off of our fcc right and because i knew that that anti-surge valve that recycle valve was not going to be able to stroke fast enough i had to lift that valve off the seat okay i had to compensate for for speed by lifting the valve off the seat about, I think I was at, a, at about 17% open. And that introduces another problem, right? And that problem is that I was constantly recycling. I remember uh, being called into an office and I had to talk to my process engineer and he's uh, he was pretty upset with me as, as, as to why my anti-surge valve was not working. I had to explain. I said, you know, the number one job of this anti-surge valve is to protect the compressor, you know, and unfortunately, our volume boosters and quick exhausts are not working well, right? And um, for me to protect the, that compressor, it, it won't stroke fast enough if we need to, if we have a surge condition. And therefore, this is the lowest I can get this, uh, I can get the valves so that it will it will be able to uh, stroke in time, right? And obviously I was constantly recycling, right? And that leads to inefficiencies, lost production, and at the end of the day, that means uh, lost lost revenue as well, right? Uh, other problems that, you know, well, here's just uh, some more examples of uh, of these volume boosters and these kind of Christmas trees that you call them, right? All the circuitry. Just remember that the the more parts you introduce, the the more chances for for failure as well, right? And these little guys right here were. Were, were a nightmare for me. Uh, other problems that you may experience with pneumatics are, are volume tanks, right? Sometimes for whatever reason, the, the they're, they'll be empty or the valves may leak, uh, faulty IDPs, right? Uh, tuning becomes a problem. And then uh, pneumatics inherently uh, will overshoot. Uh, uh, for those of you that uh, remember fit our physics classes, right? Remember that uh, air is a uh, <clears throat> air is a, a compressible medium, right? Pneumatics is you know air air is compressible, so it's squishy, okay? And uh, inherently, uh, you'll get overshoot uh, or undershoot if you try to tighten up that that control. Then you introduce lag time. Uh, I remember trying to tighten up that uh, overshoot right uh, with my with my Ida P, and uh, that would introduce uh, that would introduce some lag time, and that's not what you want. That's opposite of what you want, right? You want that actuator to stroke to stroke really fast. Other problems that I that I don't mention here are, like I said earlier, rangeability. Uh, if uh, that actuator has a a huge range. And uh, it has a long stroke. Uh, the usually what suffers is the the bottom ten percent and the top ten percent, right? So ten percent open, ten percent and below, and ninety percent and above. Usually at those ends is when you may lose a little bit of control because it is such a long stroke that uh, the pneumatic actuator can't maintain position, right? And if it's Kind of bouncing there at the bottom or at the top right that could that could potentially introduce oscillation as well okay uh, like i was saying earlier um, pneumatics are compressible and in comparison in comparison to to hydraulics so in the past um, you know pretty much what is what has predominantly be, been used is uh, pneumatic uh, control for these uh, for these any search valves right 
Um, however, um, Hydraulics uh, is, is sort of a, a newer player to this field, right? And I want to re remind you all that uh, Hydraulics is uh, an incompressible fluid, right? So it's a little stronger. Uh, it can react a little faster and it's a lot more precise than the pneumatics. Here is a comparison um, of uh, hydraulic control versus pneumatic control, right? The, the black line is the signal from the DCS, from the distributed control system, right? Uh, the green is the electrohydraulic uh, actuator, and the red is, is uh, pneumatic, right? As you can see, that hydraulic actuator is pretty much glued to that DCS controller. And uh, if you would like more examples of these, uh, we can, we'd be happy to provide these for you. We have a, a lot more of these examples. Uh, these, this is uh, real life data taken from, uh, taken from a Pi, <clears throat> Pi uh, data from, from, a, from a refinery, right? Uh, there was a test that was performed by Compressor Controls, CCC, and uh, they uh, they performed a test of uh, Rexa electrohydraulic versus uh, versus uh, pneumatics. Okay, and in that test, right, uh, they showed they were able to show that Rexa outperformed uh, the competition. And as you can see there, uh, these are just a, a a portion of the test. Uh, I can provide more information uh, if uh, if needed, but but I'm trying to respect everybody's time here because I still had a lot of slides to go. But as you can see here, um, you know the stroke and steed, the full opening right on that on that 20 to 4 milliamp signal right is 0.425 seconds. Okay, uh, I, I have seen it, a pneumatic actuator with. Of a, with a seven or eight volume boosters, and it still can't stroke in less than one second. Okay, uh, and and so on and so forth. As you can see here, you know, beating out um, uh, what uh, the requirements are for that uh, pneumatic actuator. Right. Again, you can see that the electrohydraulic uh, actuator is glued to that. Uh, to the control signal that, and that, that's that that's that dynamic response test right as you can see uh, no overshoot right zero overshoot no stick or slip remember uh the the electrohydraulic doesn't experience stiction because it, it it's hydraulic in nature right it has a lot more force to work with uh, it's also a lot more accurate and more precise <clears throat> Uh, and here is a direct uh, comparison uh, that uh, was a result of that con compressor controls test. Right, that actuator, uh, that pneumatic actuator, stroked in two and a half seconds, and Rexa stroked in less than 500 milliseconds. Uh, the test required for a max stroke overshoot response to 25% of the step. The pneumatic gave us a less than 3% full stroke in 1.2 seconds, while Rexa provided a zero, a zero overshoot in 500 milliseconds. Again, uh, myself or Alistair can provide uh, uh, further details of this test. Okay, and the actuator that we're talking about is, is Rexa electrolic actuator. Uh, when, uh, when, <clears throat> when our end users, uh, when our clients uh, uh, obtain our actuator, uh, we provide uh, the mechanical portion and also the electrical subassembly. Uh, this here is the feedback cable, and this other guy is th the motor cable. The only thing we need from the client are two things, and one of them is the control signal, usually 4 to 20 milliamp, but we also uh, manage other protocols, other communication protocols and 110 power that's that's all we need uh in some cases we may need more power and we, we will definitely uh let you know when when that when that happens right um our technology is based uh on um uh, on a patented flow match valve and flow circuit 
Um, this here is what's found inside that flow match valve. And in a nutshell, what this does basically is we have this bidirectional gear pump and motor. When this motor gets a signal, you know, whether to open or close, all it does, it sends hydraulic fluid from one side of the cylinder to the other, just back and forth. When it gets to position, the motor and the gear pump stops. So this is not, comp it's not running 24 hours a day. It, it waits for a signal. It'll stop. These ball checks hydraulically lock in place and it waits for another signal, whether to open further or, or go back the other way and close. Okay. And so that is pretty much the, uh, in a nutshell, our technology, the flow match valve. Right, and uh, you'll see these uh, power modules, and, and, and we have different uh, different uh, examples. Here is a linear, our, our, our linear model. We also have a rotary style uh, actuator for ball valves and butterflies, and a drive for uh, for other applications uh, that are that are not discussed here. But pretty much um, that flow match valve is found inside this power module as a um, just some uh, other uh, features of, of uh, this uh, test that was performed, right? Emergency trip in under less than 500 milliseconds. Uh, the dead time or the response to signal is less than 100 milliseconds. It, this, uh, this actuator is, is lightning fast. It, 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 and it can be tuned also to be slower uh, as well. So if you, we need to slow it down for whatever reason, that can also be programmed. Uh, zero overshoot. Uh, in some cases, uh, in very important applications, uh, some of our clients have asked that we provide redundant and hot swappable modules. And I'll show you a couple examples of those. Okay, uh, you can truly optimize your, your loop control with this actuator. Uh, we do provide SIL 3 if, uh, if required, right? And uh, I can go on and on, but we do a lot of uh, customization. We understand that we are going into a very severe service, critical service application, and therefore we want to make sure we get it 100% right. So um, whatever uh, uh, customization we need to uh, we need to design for your specific application, we will uh, we will we will do that for you. Um, here is a uh, an example of a Rexa electrohydraulic actuator. Uh, on a wet gas compressor. This is at BP Refinery at Cherry Point. Cherry Point Refinery is in in the north. It's in uh, Washington, in the state of Washington, uh, very close to the Canadian border, very close to Vancouver. This uh, actuator is uh, on the on uh, the Coker wet gas compressor. Okay, uh, this is. Uh, this has a, a a speed of about 500 milliseconds uh, open time. Uh, one more thing I forgot to mention. I, I left out a, a lot of details um, about the Rexa um, and for the sake of time, but this is actually a spring return. OK, and in some cases, uh, this is a small enough actuator where we designed it with spring return. And then we also have actuators where if they're if they have a a bigger uh, stroke, we will equip them with accumulators and these accumulators can be either mounted with the actuator or they can be remote mounted to a more accessible location. OK, this is uh, an end a recycle valve at Pmax Minatitan refinery. OK, this I believe is an 18 or 16 inch uh, Mason Elin 41,000 series uh, valve here. This guy has a less than one second uh, open time. Uh, we have another actuator uh, on, on hot gas bypass also uh, has to be pretty fast. Typically a hot gas bypass is uh, just, uh, you know, uh, insurance in case that any switch valve doesn't work right and, and it's also uh, bypassing hot gas before it gets to the coolers. Uh, here is the example that I was talking about where our clients requested hot swappable and redundant. This is at uh, Lindy nitrogen plant. This uh, plant uh, provides 3000 pounds of nitrogen gas 
that is injected into an oil well. And the reason for that is nitrogen gas serves as lift gas so that the client can extract that last remaining portion of crude at the very bottom of the well. OK, and this client says, you know, that they needed to make sure that uh, their anchorage valves were up and running 100 percent of the time. So we designed them uh, with uh, redundancy and hot swappable. Uh, that is another feature that I did not go into detail uh, earlier, but just really quick. We shall call this the A module and the B module. Let's say the A module happens to malfunction or some scaffolding falls on it and it doesn't work anymore. The B module immediately takes over, sends an alarm to the DCS operator, letting him know, hey, your A module is not working, but don't worry. Uh, the B module took over at the same thrust and the same speed as before. Uh, the DCS operator can then call Alistar uh, to uh, request a new power module, and this can be replaced on the run without having to bring the uh, the plant down. Uh, here are the electrical panels for the uh, for the uh, for this actuator. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, very important, is that these electrical panels can be mounted up to 700 feet away. Um, so that is very important because uh, if uh, you need to put them in a in a hazardous area that is more convenient or more accessible to the operators, then you can do that with uh, with the with the electronic controller. Um, here uh, we can also we also have a lot of other features that I that I shortcutted. Uh, one of them is uh, surge control, and uh, the other one is bumpless transfer. And also, I can change the speed. Uh, I, you know, from 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 my electronic uh, uh, subassembly here as well. Um, just really quick, surge breakpoint is uh, uh, I can I can speed up the or actually it's more speed up or speed down uh, the moment at which uh, this uh, actuator will trip open. So, for example, that, that let's say it's a CCC controller, a three plus plus that is uh, controlling. The anti switch valve. If uh, it has, let's say, greater than a 10 or 15 or 20 percent step change, whatever change you want that to be, can be programmed so that the so that the uh, either the uh, spring or the accumulator takes over and quickly opens uh, the anti switch valve. Uh, here's the example that I discussed earlier about uh, uh, the main air, air blower. Um, this is actually a blow off valve, right? Uh, in some parts of the world, it's also called a snort valve, um, but it had very similar design requirements of an anti surge valve. Okay, it had to be very fast. This is the main air blower for the fluid catalytic cracker for Phillips 66. And uh, uh, in case of overpressure, that valve has to open very fast and vent to atmosphere. Uh, this is also the example that I discussed that is it's part of their SIS. Uh, it is a two out of two configuration and the required SIL 3. And we do provide a uh, Exida SIL 3 certificate if, if needed. Uh, we also provide other solutions for your compressor train. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail here, but we provide uh, a speed, a governor speed controller if you have a steam turbine. And also we provide uh, inlet guide vein control for, for your compressor. Uh, we have also done um, other applications such as cold recycle. Uh, we have other installations. You, you just saw one in hot cast bypass, but we have additional ones. Uh, in your compressor train, uh, if you really want to tighten up control, right, we can provide you either with suction or discharge throttling control. And uh, for those cases where you have a turbine bypass, right, we, we also provide uh, uh, control for the quench valve uh, or, or otherwise known as the uh, temperator spray. Um, we have extensive experience uh, in compressor strains, compressor trains, sorry, whether there be single or multi-stage. Uh, many installations also in steam and gas turbines, main air blowers, uh, turbo expanders, pressure recovery trains, cryogenic expanders, you name it. This here is our contact information should you need to uh, send us any questions or 
If you would like further information or further details, or if you'd like some more ROI studies, or however we can, we can whatever information we can provide you with, we, we would be happy to do, to do that for you. 